we're going to look now at how Augustus employed culture uh, for propaganda purposes as a means of social control and as a means of promoting uh, his own control over the empire. Before Augustus, there were many great public men, Marius, Sulla, Julius Caesar, and they all carried out public works. So there are geo um, physical uh, recollections, if you will, of these men. So, for example, the, the one which most people remember is Pompey Magnus building the first permanent theatre in Rome. That's a big deal. And, of course, we all remember that when Julius Caesar was murdered, the Senate was actually meeting temporarily in the theatre complex of Pompey because the uh, the Senate House, the Curia, had um, been burned down. There's no trace of Sulla's theatre today, but it did exist. Um, Sulla rebuilt the Temple of Jupiter Capitolinos, and he rebuilt the Senate House, and he had planned to build a public records office, the images of which are on the screen now, that actually did happen. You can see the archway in the um, most recent uh, photograph there, um, and you can connect that with the archways in the mock image beneath it. Julius Caesar went, uh, I think, further than anyone before him in terms of mon monumentally memorialising himself. He built the Basilica Iulia and the Forum Iulium, um, including the Temple of Venus Genetrix, uh, Venus the birth giver, Gina, um, yeah, Venus the birth giver, I think. Uh, he paid for the restoration of the Basilica Amelia, and he replaced Sulla's Senate House. So Sulla built a Senate House, Caesar replaced it. All large-scale public works by which these men would be remembered. But when we come to Augustus, it kicks up a level. And Augustus was very, very savvy in that he understood the way that um, public physical objects um, could actually be an instrument of government. He wanted to imprint his personality across the entire empire. Most of the constructions that we've looked at were literally in Rome. Augustus understood the necessity of having um, this kind of uh, monument across the empire. He would use culture, art and architecture as a means of propaganda and of aggrandizing himself, making himself look big and important. To this end, and again, it's very savvy of Augustus here, coming through the Civil War, a time of enormous tumult, Augustus harked back to a mythological, legendary Roman past when Rome was glorious and when the Republic worked and men were noble. And like most dictators, I'm not entirely sure that he's harking back to a place that was real. But nostalgia is a powerful tool in the hands of a, an autocrat. And Augustus certainly made use of that emotion. Before we start, though, we need to remember that Augustus, he promoted the idea that he was restoring something. He wasn't creating a new empire. He wasn't an autocrat. He was simply returning Rome to the glory that it once had. But actually, that's a, a political sleight of hand in that he was actually creating something r relatively new in that it was an autocrat um, governing behind the appearance of a republic. I'm going to mention exemplarity a couple of times through this presentation. And exemplarity in the study of ancient Rome is a really complex um, collection of threads. For our purposes, we just need to understand exemplarity as in the sense of making an example. It's the use of Roman culture to point up kinds of behaviour and it was important in order to promote an image of the emperor. Um, later on, later than our period, people started uh, in the Roman world, they started to talk of something called Romanitas, Romanness. 
Now, much as it's outside our period, it's still very much applied that Augustus wanted to promote a certain kind of Roman behaviour, um, part of which was virtus, this idea of masculinity, which I will come to later. Um, so in a lot of Roman literature, they told stories which actually had a moral or a lesson about what was expected of a Roman person when it came to behaviour. So uh, we look at the story of uh, Cor Coriolanus or Horatius Cocles. These are stories of soldiers who encourage a certain kind of masculinity. And it's sort of setting up idealised forms of Roman masculinity and idealised forms of Roman behaviour. But the idea of exemplarity, learning lessons through these different art forms it comes through in literature in statues in public monuments in coins these are forms of art f which are actually forms of instruction for roman people in that you would look at a statue and you would you were meant to think that is how i should behave i'm not going to spend any time looking into the ways in which some roman artists subverted this um, exemplarity for example Ovid who wrote reasonably fully on kinds of Roman behavior which were not acceptable in Augustus's brave new world to the extent that Augustus eventually exiled the poet but the fact that Ovid was subverting exemplarity means that exemplarity had to exist so all the way through we need to think about how these different monuments could have posed um, lessons for the person the average Roman who observed them I'll give you an example now this picture is of Augustus it's called the Augustus of Prima Porta uh, Prima Porta is just um, where it was found the statue was created in 20 BCE and it's a demonstration of Augustus as a military leader. You can see him in full uh, military costume. It has the outstretched arm suggesting he is leading the way. But if we have a look at the detail on the breastplate, which has been enlarged there for you, you can actually see one character here. And he is holding up a Roman standard. This was a, a symbol that was carried by a Roman legion uh, when they went into battle. This image you see in front of you is um, the Parthian forces returning to Augustus the standards of the legions that were lost by Marcus Crassus when he invaded Parthia. And there had been previous attempts to recover uh, those standards, which failed. Um, Julius Caesar was about to go and uh, retrieve them when he was killed. Mark Antony, uh, he had a venture in Parthia, which ended very badly, and he failed to return them. And Augustus, not through military means, it was actually an act of diplomacy. I think we might actually call it ransom. Um, he, he managed to retrieve these standards, but you will notice it's being presented as a military victory because it was important for Augustus to appear as a military figure. Surrounding him, we can see above, below and left and right a number of Roman gods. Caelus, the god of the sky, Sol, the god of the sun, and on and on and on. And this is to link Augustus into um, notions of uh, divinity. He claims to be descended from Venus, from Aphrodite, as the Greeks would have it. And I'll come on to that shortly. Um, and to that end, you can see at his uh, right leg, there is a small child who is Cupid, the son of Venus, naturally riding a dolphin. 
Um, and again, in the one statute, you have leadership, you have military prowess, you have success, and you have a link to divine family heritage. When you bear in mind how many people in Rome could read, that is a powerful image to present. But Augustus wanted to be a number of things. And we can see in this statue, created in 12 BCE, we believe, Augustus is the Pontifex Maximus, the head of the state religion. His head is covered for a sacrifice. And what we need to take away from this is that the statues that we see of Augustus, there are only a handful of different types dotted around the empire, but they're all fairly similar. Very few of them show Augustus as an old man. He can be shown as a military leader. He can be shown as a uh, religious leader. He can be shown as a civic leader, as a politician. But he is always, well, predominantly, there are three or four different types, but he's given an ageless quality. He's never shown as an old man. He's rarely shown as a very young man. The idea is that wherever you are in the empire, you should receive this impression that this man is a powerful figure in all these different areas of Roman life. Okay. So there are the statues which have all these symbolic interpretations, but they are messages to the Roman people, the people who would see them. Um, he also had monuments and statues erected to his family in order to establish that the imperial family was worthy of their status. They are descended from gods. Um, so he, er he erected the temple to the divine Julius, um, who was his uncle. And if Julius was divine, then by inheritance, Augustus is at least somewhat divine. But if Augustus is related to Julius, Julius is related back to the original Eulus, who's related to Aeneas, and Aeneas is the son of Venus. In front of the temple of Julius, there was a, a rostrum, a speaker's platform. And along the front, it was decorated with the prows, the, the front part of Mark Antony's uh, ships that were sunk at Actium. So in front of the speaker's platform, where politicians, lawyers, people would stand and address crowds in the Roman Forum, there were also reminders of Augustus's most famous and most significant military success in the defeat of Mark Antony, all those prows of the ships. He also built triumphal arches in Rome, one commemorating the Battle of Actium, where he defeated Mark Antony. But he also erected a triumphal arch to commemorate the success in having the standards returned from Parthia, which again was a diplomatic success, but erecting a triumphal arch gives it the appearance of a military success. As we know, Julius Caesar's Senate had been burned down in 44 BCE. So Augustus rebuilt it. Sometimes the Senate House is referred to as the Curia, the Curia. And obviously he had his name written large on the side of this building. And the start of each Senate meeting in the new Senate House began with a worship of a statue of the goddess of victory, Nike in order to commemorate Augustus's victory in the civil wars. So at the start of every meeting of the Senate, they were reminding themselves that Augustus had brought peace after the civil wars. Now, on some level, it may have been conscious or unconscious, but that is encouraging people to remember. Augustus is worth having as a leader because he brought some kind of peace. While I'm talking about the Senate House, he was awarded by the Senate something called the Clipeus Virtutis, a shield of honours, and inscribed around the shield, it was made of gold. It proclaimed four virtues which Augustus 
apparently had. Virtus, pietas, clementia, justitia, valor, piety, clemency and justice. And these four virtues, are they're taken straight out of Roman exemplarity. These are modes of behaviour which the Romans admire and you see it in all of their literature and you see it in um, their statues and their representations of people. I just mentioned it in passing but I'm sure we'll come back to at least um, the virtus part of that especially. He built another forum, another large public square um, but in this particular uh, public square, the Forum of Augustus, um, he really went to town in terms of promoting himself and his place in the overarching history of Rome. By the end of this slide, you will think he was pretty power crazed. But in propaganda terms, it's hard to think of anything that would be more accomplished than this. He vowed at the Battle of Actium that he would build a temple to Mars, the god of war, in order to um, give praise for avenging uh, the people who had killed his great uncle. So when Mark Antony is killed, um, Augustus makes this pledge to build a temple to Mars Ultor, Mars the Avenger. It just occurs to me that the Marvel Avengers may be called the Altores in Latin. I'll need to look that up. In So we have the, the Temple of Mars, and you can see it in the picture at the top of the screen there. It's a very big temple. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see what's left of it. But in this new public space, he had erected 108 statues of figures from Rome's legendary history. Down the left-hand side of the forum, it was men such as Coriolanus, Horatius Cocles, um, legendary military figures um, from, uh, from Livy, I, I guess, predominantly. These are the men who fought and lived well and sacrificed for Rome. So on one side of the forum, you've got these giants of Roman history, really promoting this idea that Rome is a military um, society and the military life to fight for Rome, to die for Rome, to sacrifice for Rome is the correct way to behave. But then you go to the other side of the uh, Augustan Forum and it's all statues of men from the Julio-Claudian family, Augustus's family, Julius Caesar's family, tracing the heritage all the way back to Romulus and Aeneas. And this is really, really transparent, isn't it? It's an attempt to show how Augustus fits into the epic, legendary, mythic history and culture of Rome. His entire family is associated with it this way. And then as if that were not enough, in the centre there was a giant statue of Augustus in full military uniform. I would imagine not entirely dissimilar to the Augustus of Prima Porta. So if you were standing in the Augustan Forum, it would be impossible to come away and not think Augustus is a powerful man, but also it is right that he rules Rome because of this huge connection to Romanness, Romanitas. He didn't stop there. He built a theatre to his nephew Marcellus, or Marcellus, um, who died when he was 21. And according to some historians, Marcellus was the person Augustus really wanted to inherit the position of emperor after he died, but he died too young. Um, he also built a mausoleum. Uh, up until that point, the mausoleum of Halicarnassus uh, in Turkey? Greece, sorry, in Greece, uh, was the largest family tomb in the world. Augustus um, built one that was even bigger. And he built it way before he died. He built it in 28 BCE. It was 40 metres high. And on top of that, obviously, because this is Augustus we're talking about, 
a massive bronze statue of Augustus himself. As it happens this year, I think, the Augustus, uh, the Mausoleum Augustus has just reopened after being restored. So if you find yourself in Rome, that will be worth having a look at. Obviously, the bronze statue is long gone. That would have been pilfered by um, somebody in the distant past. Nonetheless, it's just reopened. It's worth seeing. He built the Arapakis, uh, the or Arapachis or Arapasis, depends on your pronunciation, the altar of peace. He built it in uh, the Campus Martius, the Mars fields, which were just outside the city boundary in the west of the city uh, on this pla uh, flat plain. And it was a commemoration of the peace which Augustus had established after the civil wars. It was actually built at the side of a piazza and the piazza, the square, was marked out with lines which formed a sundial and the pointer of the sundial in the middle was uh, an obelisk which had been brought back from Egypt and that obelisk, being Egyptian, was a reminder of, yes you guessed it, Cleopatra who Augustus um, defeated um, when, she was, when she sided with Mark Antony. So the sundial is a commemoration of an Augustan victory. The Arapakis is a commemoration of Augustan peace. The Theatre of Marcellus is a commemoration of Augustus's family. The Mausoleum of Augustus is a commemoration of Augustus's family. And then the last monument, the Res Gestae Dewi Augusti, um, the deeds of the divine Augustus. Now, this is interesting in the sense that the majority of Romans would not be able to read this. It was a monument, a public inscription of 35 paragraphs on two bronze columns uh, outside the mausoleum of Augustus. And it's split into four sections and each section deals with a different part of Augustus's reign. And it's all in the first person. And it's Augustus speaking directly to the reader saying, I did this, I did this, and when I was this years old, I did this, and I did this, and I did this. And it's kind of overwhelming, just this relentless torrent of statement of achievement. And some of it's true. He bends the truth frequently. He omits things from time to time. And it's an attempt to absolutely aggrandize, to big up, to express the vastness of the achievements of Augustus. Not everybody could read it though. In fact, it's estimated that a very small percentage of the population would be able to read it. So what's the point of doing it? Well, if you imagine those achievements written up large in a public monument, you would get a sense of this being a huge display. And even if you can't read, if somebody were to tell you, Oh, these are the achievements of Augustus. You would immediately think, blimey, he did a lot. So much as it might not be um, the perfect form of propaganda for people who can't read, on the other side of that coin, it kind of is. People can't read the details of it, but they get a sense of the scale. And that's what Augustus was about. The res gestae uh, is a form of literature, first person written by Augustus, not entirely true, very much for propaganda purposes. But throughout his time, Augustus, through one of his lieutenants, Mycenas, or Mycenas, depending on your pronunciation, they, cu they cultivated, they gathered around them the uh, most gifted writers in Rome. And it's kind of like if you can imagine Donald Trump very suddenly saying, um, right, I'm going to start paying Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola and Steven Spielberg and all the great film directors, uh, Michael Bay. Maybe not Michael Bay. But if, if a leader of a country started uh, gathering these film directors around them and paying them money and supporting them, you might start thinking, what do they get out of it? Well, there is a chance that they can influence the content 
of what is being produced, but also they can uh, look good in reflection. Donald Trump, whatever you think of Donald Trump, if Steven Spielberg were to make a film and say, this is only possible because of Donald Trump, you would say, well, Donald Trump's done something good there. You get the idea. And in this case, we have Virgil, Ovid, Horace, uh, Propertius, you know, all the, the big writers of the era. And Augustus benefited by being associated to them. As it happens, through some of these writers, he actually had more of an influence than, um, uh, than was merely casual. It was a way, and I'm just reading this directly from the slide, a way of reconciling men's minds to the new order of things and of investing the actual state of affairs with an ideal glory and majesty. Now that really pertains to Virgil, I would say, more than the others, but certainly in Horace we can see bits of that as well. Let's see. Virgil wrote the Aeneid. It is an epic poem charting the voyage of Aeneas, uh, one of the heroes from the Trojan War. Uh, and Aeneas sails away from Troy after it falls to the Greeks. And he is told that he must go and uh, establish a new colony, uh, which would become Rome, a new civilization. Aeneas's son was Iulus or Ascanius or Ascanius. Um, from whom Julius Caesar was descended and subsequently Augustus was connected to Julius Caesar. Uh, Aeneas, the son of Venus or Aphrodite. So Augustus could claim to be descended from the goddess if he can connect himself to um, Aeneas, which Virgil does. As it happens, and this is interesting for trivia purposes, um, Virgil died before he was completely satisfied that it was finished and did not want it to be published. But it was published and we still have it today. And I think at least part of that is because this was a useful uh, text in connecting Augustus to the gods. Romanitas, as I say, it was a concept that was really uh, talked about by the Romans more into the first and second centuries CE. But we can use it because it encapsulates some of the virtues and behaviours which uh, would later become Romanitas. Aeneas as a fictional, well we would say a fictional character, the Romans would say very much a, a, a real character, who knows maybe they were right, but he embedded some behaviours which Augustus wanted to promote to Rome. Aeneas is a military figure, he and Augustus wanted more Romans to join the armies. Uh, he was devoted to the gods, he was a man of honour, and he would sacrifice to a greater purpose, in this case Rome, famously, um, and this is where people do take sides on Aeneas, um, famously he falls in love with uh, Dido, the Queen of Carthage, uh, the Phoenician Queen, and uh, leaves her, saying that uh, the gods insist that he should continue with his um, voyage to found uh, a new a new settlement. Many readers find it difficult to forgive Aeneas for that. Anyway, Aeneas would say that giving up Dido was a sacrifice for the greater good of Rome. Remember those four virtues which are on the, the shield in the Senate House? Virtus, which is a kind of Roman masculinity, uh, good behaviour according to manliness. Pietas, devotion to the gods, clementia, clemency, uh, not being too bloodthirsty, um, and that's closely linked to justitia, justness, being fair. Aeneas encapsulates a number of those things, though there are certain instances in the Aeneas where he slips beyond them. Anyway, Horace and Virgil wrote extensively on how a Roman, a, a Roman man especially, should act, sometimes Roman women, and it coincided with, Ro uh, with Augustus wanting to make moral reforms in Rome. Um, as is always the way during a time of crisis in a state, people hark back to the past when things seem to be more stable and more understandable. I think at the moment with Brexit, we're seeing a, a little bit of that, that everything seems to be chaotic and a lot of people are harking back to um, times when things were better whether they're better or not is up for discussion 
anyway. Many Roman citizens felt that their traditional virtues of austere duty and healthy poverty were being eroded. And Augustus believed he must restore the faith and values of old Rome. The need to revive the customs and traditions of the past, a return to old-fashioned conservatism. So in 18 BCE, he introduces a law called the Lex Julia de Ed Adulteris Coercendis, which made, which made it a criminal act for a woman to have an affair. There were other laws for men, but this is the, the Lex Julia. And there was also the second law, Lex Julia de Maritandis Ordnibus, which penalised unmarried men and childless couples in order to increase the birth rate and you know he wanted people to have children and to marry and to stay together this very um, traditional family unit which he believed had been at least some way responsible for the uh, the problems of the previous 50 to 100 years i mean ignoring all of the um, economic and social causes behind the fall of the republic that we don't need to get into here and of course, it was slightly hypocritical because Augustus, as the emperor, was telling people you should marry and you should have children. And if you don't, you will be punished. Augustus and Livia, um, his wife, his second wife, didn't have children. So he was asking average Romans to stick to a standard which he didn't keep to himself. He also introduced religious reforms, encouraging more adherence to traditional worship, which links to the idea of Pietas, which links to Aeneas. Uh, in the Aeneid, uh, he's often called Pius Aeneas because he was uh, so imbued with the uh, traditional Roman religion. We are near the end, don't panic. Coins are important for propaganda purposes because they are amongst the first widespread representation of any person's name and their face. If you imagine a new king or a new queen or a new ruler coming to power anywhere in the ancient world, how do you get their face known by people in provinces or colonies or territories far beyond where they happen to live. <clears throat> Coins. Statues are expensive and take time. Public monuments are vastly expensive and, and so on. Coins. Everybody needs them. Everybody's got to use them. So, Augustus um, employed uh, coins to reinforce this sense of ubiquity, the sense that he is everywhere. And again, if he's presenting himself as some kind of divine figure, Dewey Augusti, Dewey Augustus, the divine Augustus, he needs to make sure everybody is aware of who he is. 90%, it's estimated that 90% of the Roman world could not read or write. So sending out the res gestae to the provinces was not worthless because it happened. There are several uh, places around the empire where copies were erected but it's not nearly as powerful as coins where you have a figure of somebody's face and then on the obverse something symbolic which can be easily understood um, and in the late republic people who put out coins uh, tended to commemorate uh, themselves and their families um, but in the Republican period, coins were actually quite cluttered, difficult to read. The images weren't always clear. The fonts, the, the typing was difficult to distinguish, not impossible. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're still able to decipher them today. But when you compare them to Augustus's coins, Augustus is a really quite spare, much clearer. Um, so the example you have in front of us here, we've got um, on one side, Augustus's face. You can make out Caesar on the left-hand side. And then on the other side, a crocodile. Above it, Aegypto, 
capita beneath. Very, very straightforward, even for those of you who don't have any Latin, to read that and understand that it means the capture of Egypt. And this was a coin issued after the defeat of Antony and Cleopatra. So it's a way of spreading the news of a great military success to people who can't read, who live thousands of miles away from the centre of Rome. Powerful propaganda. There's no skinny for this because it is so huge. Take your own notes. Make sure that you stick, uh, that you include the the Latin terms because those are the ones which um, you must be using. Remember, for our purposes, the word is precise. So in summary, all of this, uh, all of this was an extensive attempt to promote Romanitas, Romanness, an idea Augustus had of what Romans should be. Monuments, public buildings, sculptures, literature and coins to emphasise the far-reaching power of the emperor. Wherever you are in the empire, you will have some sort of familiarity with the face of the emperor or the deeds of the emperor or the power of the emperor through one or all of these things. It was a means of social reform by encouraging public morality through these moral laws which were then reinforced with the literature and the monuments and public control. If you imagine that, especially the Augustan Forum, it must have been quite intimidating to, to feel that amount of power. The, the word, of course, is imperium. All of it underscores the notion that Augustus is descended from gods, that he is the right person to rule, that he, you know, there's no debate here, is there? There's, there's no Brutus waiting in the wings here. And much as there may well have been people opposed to Augustus, the scale of his propaganda machine means that they just sort of fade away. And finally, the importance of statues and coins especially means that the message of Augustus as the emperor, as the power force for the empire, is accessible to almost anyone in the Roman world, whether you can read or not, whether you are Roman or not, whether you are Italian or not, you get the message. And I think this is one of the first times we see such a vastly widespread uh, promotion of one individual as um, a force of power, certainly on this scale. As usual, if you have any questions, see me in class.